How's it going Eliminators? Today I'm going to be showing you guys how to clean a carburetor on a Chinese quad. So let's get right into it. So we got this Daymac 150cc ATV here and it had a bunch of electrical problems that we had to deal with just to get it to the point where it is now. We bought a new solenoid, replaced that, ended up taking the starter off, testing that, starter tested okay. Unfortunately, even though the starter works fine, the gear inside of the engine has either sheared a key or something's happened where the starter just freewheels now and you can't use the electric starter to start this thing up, so I have to kickstart it. So the first thing's gonna be to see if we can get this thing to fire under its own power. So I've taken the air filter off the carburetor and then using a little bit of carburetor cleaner, I'm gonna spray that inside the carburetor. I'm gonna kick this thing over and we're gonna see if it fires up. The kickstarter on this thing is in like the worst position. Normally you have them on the right side over here and then you end up having it back there so you kick it backwards. And on this side, the kickstart is up here at the front so you actually have to kick it forward and then down like this and your foot kind of hits the plastic. So I can barely get my size 13 boot on there. You know, like if I actually wanted to kick it, normally my foot would be right up there, but it hits the plastic when that happens. So I kind of got to put my toes on it. And when I went to kick it over, my foot's already slipped off at once. So it's not that great of a design. Yeah, I'm gonna kick start this thing because I just want to see if I can get it to run. So there we go, we know that it runs. So now I'm gonna pull the carb off of it. So the machine started and it runs under its own power and I already knew that it had spark but now we know that it has enough spark and it has compression so it does run. It just dies after because probably the carburetor is gummed up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is drain the fuel because we gotta get all that old fuel out of there. So I'm up underneath the front left fender and you guys can see in here, we don't have that much room. However, there might be just enough room if I unbolt the neck of the carburetor that I can slide it out from here. Another way is gonna to be to remove the fuel tank. Now to remove the fuel tank on this, the fuel tank is the black plastic piece there. You have to remove the red plastic fenders and to get that off, well, it's connected to your front fenders. So you're gonna to have to start removing your bolts here. You're gonna have two bolts here on either side. You got a bolt here, a bolt over there, and then we also have some bolts underneath our fenders. And then we have one at the front of the machine as well. So I'm gonna to try to get as much disassembled as I can before I have to start trying to take off any plastics. So the first thing I'm gonna do is come up here to our throttle cable and we're gonna unthread that little cap at the top of the carburetor and we're gonna pull out the spring and the throttle plate. So when you unthread that, you guys can just put that off to the side. Just kind of hang it out of the way. Right there should be fine. I've also gone ahead and disconnected our fuel line. Then what I'm gonna do is run this end into a tank and then we'll go ahead and drain the fuel tank. Now that I got the fuel tank drained, the next step is gonna be coming over here and removing the 10 millimeter nuts on the studs from the engine. Now once you got both of those loose, should be able to come up here and pull that right off of the studs. Now there is an O-ring or a gasket normally that goes on the bottom of there and right up inside of there. So you guys can see that little lip there that's the O-ring, so I'm gonna have to inspect that, make sure it makes a good seal. But now that you have it loose, we should be able to come up here and slip this carburetor right out, just like that, guys, so we didn't have to remove the plastics on this one, which is pretty nice because these bolts in here, a lot of times, they're rusted, seized solid. You'll strip the Phillips head off of the front, so you're reefing on it, trying to get it off, and you either strip the head or you snap a bolt and you have to replace them. So when we go to put this carburetor back onto this machine, once it's cleaned, we're gonna put it in the same way. We're gonna slip it in and then drop it down. And then from each side, we can go ahead and get each of the nuts on. So now that we have this on our workbench, we can go ahead and remove our bolts from there just to take this neck off. And this neck coming down here, uh, it stops right at there. So there is a seam and this bottom piece that slips into our engine, that's a second piece by the looks of it. So I'm guessing there's also gonna be a gasket that goes in here as well. So we might have to check that to make sure that the gasket's good and that there's a good seal there. Okay, so we've taken the neck now that's come off of the carburetor. So there's gonna be a little plastic spacer and there's gonna be a little indent there. And that is for 
your o-ring here and that just makes a seal there you guys can see a little bit of gas coming out not that bad uh, here's our bottom piece again so this goes just like that and sure enough there's a gasket on here it's pretty old so I'm going to replace this, I'm just going to tear it off, and we're going to get this cleaned up as well. I'm going to clean the neck up, and I'm going to show you guys how to disassemble this carburetor. Because you guys got to remember that if you're cleaning a carburetor, the best way to get it as clean as possible is to get it as disassembled as possible. So you want to take as much off of the carburetor as you possibly can. Okay, so the first thing I've done, I've taken a Phillips head screwdriver and removed the three screws from the bottom of this carburetor. So now we can have a look inside of our sediment bowl. There's a a bit of gunk down in the bottom of there and you guys can see that the gasoline is orange it's just old fuel now that the sediment bowl is off we can have a little look inside of our carburetor here so we have what's known as a main jet that's the big one there underneath that is your pilot jet and then here is your air fuel ratio screw so we're going to be removing all three of these so that I can get in there and clean. Now, depending on the model of your ATV, your carburetor may differ from the one that you're seeing here. The majority of them are built all the same. You're gonna have a sediment bowl, a few screws holding that on. You're gonna take that off. This here's your float, and this float, as it goes up and down, it lifts up a little needle valve inside of here. So what happens is when your carburetor is like this on your machine, and there's no fuel in the sediment bowl, the float drops down and opens up that little needle valve in there. And that needle valve connects to this hose right here, which is your fuel line. So your fuel comes in here, goes through the needle valve right there, that opening, and it fills your sediment bowl. And as the fuel fills the bowl, it lifts the float and closes that needle valve. So if you have a needle valve that's not seating properly, when this fills up with fuel, it won't seal properly and your fuel from your fuel tank will continue to fill the sediment bowl, which will then go into the carburetor and then that'll go from the carburetor down the intake neck and then into the bottom end of your engine. So if you've ever gone and checked your oil and it smelt like gas, chances are you have a needle valve there that's not seating properly. So to remove this float, we're just gonna pull this pin right out of here and we can lift our float up and you guys will see our needle valve there comes with it. You can just set that off to the side. So these needle valves here, they have a little rubber tip on them. You guys can see that. And sometimes as these things get older, that rubber tip will no longer make a good seal. So you get a new one with a fresh rubber tip on it and normally that solves any fuel leakage issues. Now for these jets here, you guys can see they are slotted. So for the main jet, I'm gonna be using a seven millimeter wrench and we're gonna take that out and then I'll go ahead and remove the other jet and the air fuel mixture screw. So here's our main jet, there's our pilot jet. And a lot of times guys, if you have a machine that just won't start at all, chances are you have just a clogged main jet. So we can see in here, there's a very tiny hole in there, right? So that's probably got some gunk built up in there because that hole should be a little bit bigger than that, especially for a main. So I'll hit it with my compressor and see if I can blow some stuff out of there. Now, if you don't have a compressor, you can use an oxyacetylene fuel tip cleaner. However, you guys have to be careful because on these, they have little ridges on them and you could actually start taking away material off of a brass jet and you don't wanna do that because your jet is set to a certain size and that allows a certain amount of fuel to go through it. If you have smaller holes to clean, such as your pilot jet here, you can go ahead and get a twist tie and peel off the paper, piece of steel inside of there that you can use to poke through. So I've used my oxyacetylene tip cleaner just to poke out this main jet. And if we have a look here, you guys can see now a big difference. So if we have a look at it before on the left there, and then you see the after on the right, massive difference so chances are this is why the machine was hard to start and wouldn't run right but i still have some more cleaning to do on the carburetor moving on to our air fuel ratio screw here little tip before you go ahead and remove this take a standard flathead screwdriver such as that and thread it in not tight you just want to snug it up but when you do that you want to count the number of turns before it bottoms out so then when you go to put this back in you can bottom it out 
and then go out as many turns as you went in and that'll put it in the same spot that it was before. Now, normally these are set to anywhere from one and a quarter to one and three quarters of a turn, but it varies depending on what kind of carburetor you have. Some of the China carbs are completely different, guys. So if you can, go ahead and check your manual and see what it recommends. So I'll show you guys a easy trick, the way that I get a lot of my service manuals and stuff like that. So on the front of this machine, there's a little plaque here and on this plaque there's a serial number. So what I would then do is go to Google and type in the model number and then see what pops up. You don't want an owner's manual, you want a service manual or a parts breakdown and normally you'll be able to find something online that will give you some specs, some carb specs, what jet sizes to run in the carburetor, how many turns the idle screw is supposed to be at, how many turns the air fuel ratio screw is supposed to be at, and etc. And you guys want to be careful when you're threading those in I said not to go all the way too tight because there's a little fine tip on there and you can jam that tip inside of the carburetor and break it off and then your air fuel ratio screw won't do what it's supposed to. So now that you have everything removed off of the bottom of your carburetor, now's a good time to go ahead and just take a look at your gaskets and your O-rings, the one up here at the top as well, and just have a good inspection. You want the O-ring to pass the metal. So if we're looking at that O-ring on the front, the circular one, you guys can see that it's a little fatter than the metal and it sticks out a little bit. And what that means is when our carburetor intake neck here bolts onto there, it'll make a nice seal in between those two mating surfaces. And the same thing with this gasket down here, it looks to be in good condition. I shouldn't have to replace that. So these Chinese carbs here, there's not much to them. Three screws right there and the sediment bowl came off. A couple jets came out of it. We got an air filter over there with one little hose clamp on it basically and we were able to do all of this with uh, just a Phillips head screwdriver, a standard flathead screwdriver and a 7 millimeter wrench as well as the 10 millimeter wrench we used to take the nuts off of the engine. In comparison, I have a 350 Yamaha carburetor that was taken off of a Yamaha Bruin ATV and you guys can see there's side plates here, there's top covers up here and there's just generally a lot more to clean. There's a lot more passageways inside of here. You guys can see there's a jet that's removable. Again, these China carbs, they're pretty easy to clean. Like I said, there's not much to them. So now we're gonna move on to the cleaning process. And I'm gonna be using an ultrasonic cleaner for all of my cleaning because it is far superior to carb cleaner spray. However, I realize that not all of you out there watching this video are gonna have a $300 ultrasonic cleaner. So go out and get yourself a can of carb cleaner. I have here just some gum out small engine carb and choke cleaner. Make use of this nozzle guys. So you're gonna to wanna to go in here to all these little holes you see here. And you're gonna to wanna to put the nozzle in there and you're gonna to wanna to spray. And you're gonna to wanna to blast out all of the contaminants and the gunk that's been built up over the years. Going back to the oxyacetylene tip cleaner, these things work awesome. So you can take one of these, you can find the correct size, and then you can go ahead and use one of these to poke the holes through. So if there's a lot of dried gunk built up in there, you can use that and just kinda get all of the nasty bits out of there. So now you can see it actually goes all the way down. And then once you have all the harder bits knocked out of there, then you can go ahead and use your carb cleaner and go ahead and spray inside of there. Same thing with the holes under here, guys. So go ahead and take your carb cleaner and then right in there to blast all those holes. And like I said, you know, make use of that oxyacetylene tip cleaner or just any small piece of metal that you can to use to poke through those holes. So I'm just going through the air fuel mixture screw here just to make sure because it's a very tiny, fine hole at the top there and we're just making sure that it's free of debris and that'll loosen up all of the harder stuck on bits and you should be able to blast all of the rest of the contaminants off now you guys don't have to have that clean of a workspace when you're disassembling this thing however when you're going to reassemble this thing i highly advise having a piece of cloth down so that you can organize all your parts obviously this rag is dirty but you want to have something where you can set all your little pieces down just like this so that you can have everything organized and then you can go ahead and put everything back together in a nice clean and organized workspace so that you're not getting any little bits of debris like anything here right that little piece could get lodged into a main jet 
and then you'd have issues when you go to reinstall this thing. So again, you're spending all this time to disassemble it and you're taking the time to clean it and reassemble it. You don't want to have to do the work twice. Now I use a GT Sonic ultrasonic cleaner. You can set it to heat up to 80 degrees Celsius, but normally I just take some water from the kettle, not necessarily boiled, just slightly under that, and then we run it for a period of 20 minutes. And if I remove the lid here, you guys can see all the nasty stuff that comes out of carburetors. And that, guys, all of that around the edges is dirt and sediment from inside of a carburetor. Now, some of the pieces in there are slightly bigger, but most of the discoloration you see in the center here, that's all very fine stuff, almost like a sand. So if I just take a toothbrush here, you guys can see that it is just like sand. You know, it's really fine stuff. And all of this gets built up onto the insides of the carburetors. So I used to use carburetor cleaner to clean carburetors. Now I use an ultrasonic cleaner because like I said, it's far superior. But if you're on a budget, I understand that not everybody can afford one of these things. But if you can and you're doing a lot of carb cleans, I would highly suggest using an ultrasonic cleaner. So I got some hot water here from the kettle. I'm going to pour just a little bit into my ultrasonic cleaner here. Then I'm going to add in a little bit of Indo 701 Industrial Strength Degreaser. We use this when we're doing carburetor cleans. This stuff is concentrated, guys, so you don't need much. And then I'm going to go ahead and add in the rest of my hot water to mix that all in. So you guys can see a nice clear solution with a little bit of pink coloration to it. So I got my little cage here. I got my carburetor. I have my sediment bowl, and then I'm going to end up putting all my little jets inside of there, and we're going to get this thing cleaned up. But you guys can tell just how well it works. I mean, the liquid in there is starting to go from a clear and pink to now a cloudy. And you can actually see out of the fuel intake what looks to be like smoke coming out of there, but that's little tiny minute particles that are being blasted apart by what's called cavitation. So cavitation is essentially the implosion and explosion of little tiny water and air bubbles that are in there. And it's just blasting apart everything inside of that carburetor. When we looked at those main jets before and after I poked it through, chances are if I were to put this carburetor back onto the machine, it would have run. It might not have run that great because the air fuel mixture screw was wrongly adjusted. However, chances are it would have run. But like I said, we're doing a full service on this ATV, so it's getting the full treatment. Okay, so I've now let this run for 20 minutes. We can see a little bit of stuff in there floating around, which is good. That's always good signs. I'm gonna grab this carburetor here with my pair of locking forceps, and we're just gonna have a look at it. And you guys can see already just the difference of it. It's completely clean, but I'm still going to run it for another 20 minutes. And already, the water started to discolor a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead, drop that back in there, run it for another 20 minutes, and then we'll go ahead, take it out, rinse it off, and blow it out with my air gun. I've also gone ahead and cleaned up our intake neck here, just on my wire wheel that I have over on my bench grinder here. And basically, I just wanted to clean off the mating surfaces so you guys can see it nice and clean and shiny now. Okay, so I just pulled this carburetor out of the ultrasonic cleaner, and you guys can see, check that out, perfectly clean. So now, I'm gonna take my air hose here on my compressor, and I'm gonna blow out all the holes here. We're gonna go in here to the fuel inlet valve here. Blast all that water out of there. So like I said, put down a nice clean piece of paper towel. We have our carburetor here, maybe a little before, and then there's the after. We can see it did an awesome job at cleaning that all up. So before I go ahead and reassemble everything, I wanna go here to what's known as the metering tube, but there's tiny little holes you guys can see here. And you just want to go and make sure that every one of those is poked out. Again, if you don't have an oxyacetylene tip cleaner, you can go ahead and just use a wire out of a twist tie. And that should be small enough to get through those little holes. So now that we know that all of our holes are poked through and everything is clean and spotless, we can go ahead and put our main back in, then our pilot jet, and then our air fuel mixture screw. Now we can go ahead and take our float and put it back on, but before we do, you guys wanna make sure that this float actually floats. So these are made out of plastic. Sometimes the older carbs, they're made out of brass, 
and basically what can happen is on the plastic ones the plastic can crack and on the brass ones they have a little seam similar to this one and they're normally brazed together and sometimes the braze can come apart and what will happen is there will be a small crack or hole and these will actually fill with fuel so when your machine is sitting there instead of floating on top of the fuel it will fill with fuel and sink to the bottom which means our needle valve right here will constantly be letting fuel into your engine no good just make sure that it floats guys okay then this tab right here go ahead and hook your needle valve up onto that and we can drop it in and once you have everything lined up go ahead and put your pin in now on this one it has a little bent tab here and that is a stopper so it only allows your float to go that far you don't want it to go too far because what can happen is this can hit your sediment bowl and it can actually get stuck on there which is not good so again just make sure that you have your float positioned in the right spot you want to make sure that it's not upside down either I've also gone ahead and reinstalled my little drain screw here I took that out just in case there was any sediment in there so now we're ready to take our bowl and put it back on top of the carburetor we're gonna get those screws back in you guys want to make sure you don't over tighten these either you kinda just want to snug them up one by one and then you can go ahead put a little bit of pressure onto them but not much because these things are super easy to strip because they're Phillips head screws and also it's going into aluminum so it's fairly easy to either strip the threads or just snap that screw off in there so now what I'm gonna do is reinstall our carburetor neck here so again our little plastic piece with the groove inside of it we're gonna line that up with our gasket then we can go ahead and tighten these up now you guys want to make sure that these bolts up here are tight because we don't want any air getting in there because you have to remember that the air is mixing with the fuel inside of the carburetor so when the fuel is coming in from your fuel tank it's atomizing with the air inside of this carburetor which means that there's already an air fuel mixture coming through here that's set to what should be 14.7 to 1 that's the optimal air fuel mixture now what can happen is if you get an air leak in here you're gonna get what's called a lean mixture so you're gonna get excess air after the mixture an air leak over here by your air filter is no problem because your carburetor can sort that out but after you don't want any leak that's why we replace the gasket down here and that's why we make sure these bolts up here are nice and tight. Now I'm gonna do what's known as a carburetor pressure test. So I'm gonna take this little pump here and I'm going to pump it up to the point where it has some PSI in it and we're gonna let it sit and hold there for a bit and we're gonna see if it leaks. So if it leaks like it is now, that means that our needle jet with that little rubber tip has a slow leak, which means that we would have to replace it. Now if I pump it up and it holds, that means that our needle jet is sealed and we don't have to replace it. This is an important test because once I put the carburetor back onto the machine, if it has a slow leak, I will only find out afterwards once the fuel gets into the carburetor and down into the bottom end, and that's not good, guys. You take this rubber tube and you put it on to where your fuel intake is. Now, you have to remember that the float in here is going on a 45 degree angle, so it's going this way, right? because there's no fuel in the sediment bowl. So when I pump this up right now, with the carburetor in the upright position, air should be leaking through and it should not build pressure. However, if I flip it upside down, it should start to build and hold pressure. So I've got a little adapter here on my pump and I'm going to try to get this in frame. I'm gonna hold it like this and obviously no pressure should build, right? Because the float isn't engaging the needle valve, but if I flip this, upside down we'll be able to see the pressure start to build and we can see that it holds we got it holding just over 5 psi now so the needle valve on this carburetor seals so we should be good to go okay so i'm over here on the quad underneath the front right fender and we can see that this adapter here it has a little curve to it and if we look in here we can see that the top of the block has a curve and it's lower at the back of the block so this little adapter here goes in a certain way guys so you're going to want to put it with that little groove towards the back so you're going to want the flat piece towards the front so when it drops in it should look flat just like that so now we're ready to put our carburetor back onto the ATV now this carburetor didn't have a clamp 
on this end of the fuel line and I'm going to be putting one on because we can see that this fuel line here is pretty loose. So I'm going to go ahead and put a clamp on there. So I bought an assortment of fuel line clamps because I go through them like crazy and I'm always needing uh, different sizes for different jobs that I'm doing depending on what kind of fuel line is being run. So like always guys, links are going to be in the description down below. I got anywhere from six millimeter all the way up to 15 millimeter. So I ended up using an eight millimeter fuel line clamp. We got her clamped on here. You guys want to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the choke. So we just want to make sure that those little spring ends are out of the way of this choke, which is right here. So you guys can see the choke comes up and on this one, it clears our fuel line clamp. So if that was turned any farther, it wouldn't clear it. But we can see that there is in fact a space in between it. So again, a lot of people wouldn't do that, but I like to just to make sure that there's no leaks. You never know if a kid's gonna be riding this thing, so you always wanna make it nice and safe. And just before we go to put everything back on, I should add that this screw here with the spring on it, that's your idle screw. So that's gonna set your RPMs. And basically I just set it at I think two turns out, so go all the way in until it's snug, and then go about two turns out, and we won't really be able to adjust that until the machine is running. Okay, so I've got our carburetor fit back inside of there. I went through the other side. I'm just filming from this side because it's a little bit easier to see. Okay, so we got our carburetor nuts on the intake neck there, all bolted up. The only thing we have left to do is thread back on our throttle cable here. And just before I go to thread that back on top of the carburetor, I just wanna show you guys again, this little slot up here, we're gonna be lining it up to the idle screw. So you can see here, it's got a little 45 degree angle right there. So essentially what happens is that idle screw goes in and depending on how far it goes in, it pushes up against that little 45 degree notch. And if you thread that idle screw in, it'll lift this up, which will then lift your metering rod up. And because there's a smaller taper and a finer point at the end of that, you will have more fuel going through your main jet. So that'll raise your RPMs. And again, if you loosen it and bring it out, this will drop down, letting less fuel through. So you'll have a lower RPM. So just to orient yourself, I am on the left side of this machine and our idle screw is on the right side of this machine. And we're gonna line this up like that when we go to stick it into the carburetor. So the long end is gonna be on the left side of the machine and the short end is gonna be on the right. Now if you're not lined up, this cap right here will be really hard to get on. So you should be able to pop that on just like that without any real tension up against it because that means that that throttle plate is seated all the way down inside of this little tube. So I'm gonna have to kickstart this thing. So let's see if we can get this thing to fire, shall we? Well, there we go. The idle's too high. So I gotta turn the idle down. So again, we gotta go right into there. That's our idle screw, so you guys can see hardly any room to get at it. So what I'm gonna do is unthread that to bring our idle down just a bit, but this thing fired right up once we got some fuel into the carburetor. Well, we got her running. She idles, and that's it. So what I had to do was adjust the idle, but too low and it wanted to stall, too high and it took right off. That's what happened there in the garage. And that's because the brakes didn't work. Now over here on the parking brake, let me just shut this off. Over here on the parking brake, when I had that engaged in the garage, what ended up happening was there was air in the line. So what I did was to bleed the brakes, you gotta pump, 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 and hold. And you come back here to this little nipple right there, and you open it up, and you'll see brake fluid come out. And you wanna keep holding your brakes. So you'll go pump, 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 and you'll have somebody back here, and you'll say, okay, holding, and then they'll open it, and then they'll say closed. And then you can pump, 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 and again, you say holding, and then they open it up. And what happens is, as fluid comes out, you'll see air bubbles starting to come out as well. So before, if you went to push this thing forward with the brakes uh, engaged on the parking brake, you'd be able to just push it right forward. Now, it locks up. So you get that little bit of movement in the axle, but where the brake is, you guys can see solid, no movement. So there's a little forward and back movement, but unfortunately I can't fix that because if I idle it down any more, 
it'll just stall. Now basically what happens on these machines is over on the left side of the machine, there's a centrifugal clutch and they engage to a drum inside of the engine. So there's a drum on the outside and then there's pads on the inside and they're on springs. So once your engine gets to a certain RPM, what'll happen is those pads will extend outwards and grab that outer drum, thus engaging your drive. Now the problem with those centrifugal drives, especially on these uh, China quads, they're just not made of the same quality materials like something like a Honda or a Yamaha, Suzuki, Kawasaki would be. So those springs over time get basically degraded and the spring tension, the spring rate of that spring itself changes. So instead of having a certain amount of spring rate on it or tension, the springs end up getting really loose and uh, they're not very springy anymore. And then what'll happen is that centrifugal clutch will now engage at like 500 RPM. So you constantly have to keep turning your RPM down to the point where your machine won't roll forward anymore. So essentially after a little brake bleed, we were able to solve the brake issue. At least his back brakes work now and you can put the parking brake on and start the machine up and it doesn't take off on you. So as far as this job goes, it's done guys. I'd like to do a better job, more quality job, but when you're working on this China stuff, you really have no choice. As for the forward and reverse, when this thing was running, I ended up putting this into reverse and it went into reverse and then I put it back into forward and it stayed in reverse. So I had to wiggle it around, I had to hit it a little bit and you know, like I said guys, when you're dealing with this uh, Chinese stuff, the quality just isn't the same. So as far as an oil change goes, I'm not sure if the guy wants to spend the money, but I'm sure he'll want me to do an oil change on it and then the thing's basically serviced as much as it can be to the point where he can just ride it around his land and uh, just kind of beat on it and not really care. So if you guys enjoyed the video, think about leaving me a thumbs up. You know, it really helps me out. You can click here to subscribe and you can click over here to watch one of my previous videos. I upload every single week, so be sure to come on back next week and check out what we got new on the channel. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.